of Yanni. So the three. The implication of employee relocation policy on the employee's motivation in an Indonesian government organization. A case study of the Indonesian board of boards. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I would like to say thank you, first of all, for giving a chance to share my ongoing research project here. My name is Telviani. I'm from the University of York, and I'm a PhD student in second. Oh, sorry, I'm entering the third, the third year now. And as you know, the title is the implication of the employee education policy. So it's uh, one aspect of human resource management and uh, focus is in, in Indonesian uh, government institution. Um, I know you are all must be very excited now, not because you want to listen to me, because this conference will be ended very soon. <laughs> so, well, no more boring presentation after this afternoon. Yay. <laughs> okay, so let's start with uh, my agenda for this afternoon. I would like to say, uh, tell you about my research background first, and then my research questions that I have so far and the methodology that I use in my, in my research project and the challenges I encountered when I, doing my, when I was doing my field work and if I still have time I want to share you a few initial findings that I have. Okay. Um, this is the map of Indonesia. You know among the Southeast Asian countries Indonesia is the largest one and the most populous one. Um, we, the size of our, our country is almost 2 million kilometers square with 34 provinces and maybe it will grow, I don't know when, but it's still growing. We have around 14,000 islands and the population is around 250 million and the number of civil servants is around 4.5 million. Um, another quick glance of Indonesia map, if we put um, UK map on the top of Indonesia, we can see how big Indonesia compared to UK. It's like almost eight times larger. So that's why, because um, Indonesia is an archipelagic country with diverse and um, with so much typology and geographical diverse um, condition, and also hundreds of tribes and cultures. I think it is quite difficult for the government to take care of this country. That's why it makes me impressed to do some research. Well, a part of I'm an Indonesian and <laughs> I got a scholarship from my government. Well, I think it's still interesting to do some research on Indonesia. Um, as like Ms. Tanya also said before, um, generally the Indonesian state uh, can be, the, the history of Indonesian state can be divided through these, um, through these uh, phases, start from colonialism, where the Dutch invaded our country for about 350 years. And then after that, <laughs> Japan came to um, occupy us for only three and five years. And we only, well, yeah. Well, after that, we gained the independence in 1945. And we have our first president, Sukarno, during um, along like 21 years. And then he was replaced by General Suharto. And he will rule our country quite some times, for 32 years. And then after that, uh, the, his regime that we call New Order regime was collapsed in 1998. And since then, it's like Indonesia entering a new phase of political situations, that what we call reform or democratization era. Um, it's like an euphoria for Indonesia because we feel like we are freed from the old authoritarian leadership presidential period for a long time. So we think in this phase we can have a f more freedom in political uh, speech, etc. So we have like um, some characteristic here. For um, the last 16 years, we already have five presidents. We implement a new direct presidential election. And we also have decentralization, where we still some pa some power of some part of the central of central leaders uh, central government power to um, regional regional government. And in this phase, I don't know. We like to amend that our national constitution. So far, we already have four times amendment. I 
Yeah, I wonder whether it's uh, similar to Harry Potter novel, <laughs> until seven times, then we, still, we stop. But one of the amendments, the third one, give power to the case study uh, organization that I'll focus on, the Indonesian Audit Board. What is Indonesian Audit Board? If you look at the map in the Indonesian constitution, this is um, the Audit Board, the organization um, that I choose for my case study. Um, it has function similar to UK National Audit Office, and in the Indonesian constitution, it has similar um, position to other high state institutions. So we have this, uh, it has similar like position to the president, the People Consultative Assembly, and also the Supreme Court Constitution Court and Judicial Commission. So if you look at the map and the position, I think this organization has important role and because we are in the reform era um, where we um, have a spirit to combat the collusion and corruption and nepotism, those three terms that is so famous in Indonesia, I think um, this organization has the same fu um, similar function or in line, the spirit is in line with the reform era to combat the corruption because it, uh, its task is to audit the state financial management and accountability. And due to the amendment, it also um, undergoing the rapid expansion. So as you can see here, we only have three regional offices uh, in New Order era, in presidential uh, Suharto's, in Suharto's era, and then it grows to seven regional offices after uh, we enter in the reform era, and now it grows to 34 regional offices. So we have uh, one, uh, we have regional office in each provinces in Indonesia. During some, well, during short time, we expand so much, and we also recruit more and more employees. Say we have 2,800 in 2007, and now we already have 6,000, and it's still growing. We're still recruiting more employees. That's one reason why I do this research. And the second one, um, research on the Indonesian human resource, especially in public institution, is scarce. I don't know why, maybe it's still under research. And, and the third reason is much of the research that's focusing on the impact of relocation practice um, utilize quantitative method. So they test any relationship between uh, relocation practice with the uh, salary, with the satisfaction, etc., etc., et but I think we are lack of uh, in-depth explanations uh, why why they have this kind of uh, dissatisfaction or demotivation, etc. That's why I choose um, qualitative method for my research. Mm. These are the research questions that I have so far. It may be chat. <laughs> It may be chance uh, later on after I'm doing my analysis, but these are three. Like I want to know um, how the employees perceive the uh, relocation practice, the relocation policy that we currently have, and then we want to know also. Uh, I want to know also the impacts of the relocation practice to the motivation motivation of the employees, and the third one. I want. I would like to know is there any good model that can be implemented in Indonesian public institution. Um, methodology, as I told you before, I use qualitative and case study only for one specific organization because you know the reason that I told you before. And I did face-to-face -face semi-structured interview. I did my field work last year uh, from July to September 2015. I was able to interview 33 staff from three regional offices from Aceh, the most western part of Indonesia, and then West Kalimantan, the middle part, and the most eastern part is Papua. So uh, I choose three different regional offices that has three uh, different characteristics also. And then Aceh and Papua um, also well uh, in public, in public um, view, there are still um, conflict areas in those two, so I, I want to know the perception of the employees who, who have been placed there, uh, what, what they are 
um, experiencing day, day by day when they do their, uh, their <coughs> job. And I want to know also the perception from the managers, so I would like to see the perception from the staff and the managers who um, do the, who set up the policy or who implement the policy. And I also uh, want to know the perception from other external managers from related industry, because in Indonesia, um, civil servants matter are handled by several ministry and agency. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, we have a ministry of finance who handle the budget. We have also ministry of um, empowerment of state apparatus. We have national institute for public administration as well. So I come to those ministry to gain their um, opinion. Mm, okay, this is the challenges that I have when I do my field field, field, field work. Sorry. <laughs> Um, first of all, because I am an employee of this organization, it is not a problem for me to get access to that, to that organization. It is easy. But I got a difficulty when I tried to uh, gain access to other ministries. I try, first, I tried to do the formal procedures, like I emailed them through the, their website's email, but until one month, I didn't get any reply. <laughs> Well, yeah, you know, so I emailed them again, I didn't get any reply still, so, okay, two times, three times, no, no reply at all, how come, they put it in their website, so no wonder, um, what else that I should do, and uh, then I think, oh yeah, I have friends who work there, and I, yeah, then I contact my friends, lucky me that she, she and he can help me to get specific email address <laughs> to the person in charge so I directly email them and still no reply only one <laughs> only one reply from Ministry of Finance but they just replied like asking me so many documents to attach also to explain my research etc so okay <laughs> I replied it and I submit everything that uh, they ask they ask and that's it while well, I already in Indonesia <laughs> for about uh, Two weeks. There's not, no no signal, no response at all. So I focus my research to uh, gain the to do the interview in um, in the audit board first because it is easy and it is still manageable. And while I'm doing the research uh, and the interview in my own in my organization, I still try to find a way to get the access to those ministry. Um, because I don't have no, I have no luck. Then I tried to call one of my friends who works in Ministry of Finance, and I said, "Can I come directly?" And you ask, you take me to the person in charge, and he said yes. So I come. That's the shortcut that I have to do. Because if I if I wait for the formal response, I will not get any 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 response. While um, my time is limited there, so I just come and. Lucky me, he took me to the person in charge, and then it's um, more easy, easier after that. I asked them, I asked them, why is this so difficult? Why you, uh, did, you, did you receive my email? And they, they said, yes, we do. Then why, it, why you didn't answer anything? And they said, well, uh, actually we, we received it, and we have to give it to the top level, mm -hmm. and we have to wait for the instructions of the top level. So it's like going back and forth, going back and forth all the time. Well, well yeah. um, my first thought is, well, it's confirmed the article that I read, that the nature of government organization is rigid, complex, and inefficient. Despite, <laughs> despite of um, their name is bureaucratic reform, and <laughs> they have the spirit to um, cut off the bureaucratic process, yeah. Yeah, we still have that kind of, oh thank you, we still have that kind of rigid, rigidity. So uh, the solution is find a person who is who knows the people, so we go directly to them, so it is easy. <laughs> Ask me, I can uh, interview all of them. And then the other um, challenges that I have is my, researcher, my role as a researcher. Um, as an insider, I get a full acceptance from the staff. 
they they believe me and they told they told me a lot of experience that they have. But on the other hand, they expect me much. Even though I at the first time of every interview, I told them that I I am here not because I'm a worker of this organization, but I'm a researcher. But they expect me much like. They expect me somewhat uh, to become a channel to the top leader to tell them about the problems that they have, and they expect me that I could give a sol quick solution for the problem. So that's um, one of the challenges that I had. Um, this is initial findings, few initial findings that I could share with you. Um, the first one, because I want to know the motivations of the civil servant. <laughs> I, <laughs> uh, I the early motivation. I refer to the public service motivation, you know, that they said um, the people who choose to have a career as a civil servant have altruistic intention, have a heroic motivation to help others uh, or maybe to help the, the nation. But um, in my case, uh, it didn't happen. All those 33 respondents answered differently. 23 respondents answered, well, we come here just to get a job. That's it. And 10 of the respondents told me either it is a counter or either they have to obey their parents because their parents asked them to do a civil servant. That's it. Like you can see the quotation from two respondents. It's an honor in Batak culture to be a civil servant. It's like raise their high status and Another one because their parents, his parents crying out loud in front of him, so he has to take the job. So this is the motivation of the civil servant in my case study. Uh, another um, initial finding that I can have the opinion about the current relocation policy. Most of them tell the current relocation policy is ineffective, um, theoretically okay, but realization is not effective. The I'm clear because the tenure in one regional office is not clear. Some people can stay a long time in area and doesn't move at all. Some people can stay in head office for the rest of their tenure. So that's uh, what uh, the respondent said. They also said it's unfair because there's still nepotism and favoritism. Because uh, I can't deny that in my organization, we still have like a top, le top leaders or top managers that have another relatives work in the same place. They have their kids, um, some have their wives, some have, well, everything like, it's, the relatives are working in the same place. So they say this is also unfair because all those people who have special relationship can choose the place where they, they want to work, can choose the place that are comfortable with them. So this is what the respondent said. And the impact, when I asked about the impact, they say, yeah, it's various. So that's why I have to analyze further. They said either they don't have any impact because of the relocation, but some people also said they have um, positive impact. Some people said negative impact. Some people said um, impact them in both ways. And another interesting fact that I can share you is the different perceptions that I have from manager side as the policymaker and the staff who uh, who's experiencing the relocation, like auditor independence. As an auditor, we have to maintain our independence. And the manager said, this is the main reason why we relocate the people, the employee periodically. But um, from the staff side, they said, independence, it depends on the characters and the intention of the auditors themselves. So relocating the people periodically doesn't, is not an effective way to maintain the auditor independence. That's one reason. Another one, transparency. When we talk about transparency, um, the manager always refers to the health conditions. So they, they have an analogy like a general, general practice, practitioner who holds the medical records. They said, well, because they have a serious illness, then we can we cannot share this this um, privacy to other people. That's why we have to keep the information. But the staff wants the transfer the transparency in other in other things. You mean uh, the transparency in the criteria 
who are the people who are supposed to be relocated and how long the people can stay in one regional offices and then they want to know also the transparency in the terms of the amount of moving allowance because when I asked them they admit that they um, receive difference moving uh, the moving allowance so they want to know the diff, uh, the transparency in that kind of facility and then transparency also in policy they said no more intervention please no more intervention now when i asked about intervention from top level um, the manager said it is not intervention no it is not intervention it is a way to maintain the business process so it can keep running effectively that's why they said why they that's why they say why, when I asked them about why you hold some people in some in uh, you working unit for a long time that you cannot you, why you do not um, relocate these people or they stay there. There are some people who stay in the same working unit for 30 years since he recruited until now. So, uh, but this is the response that I get from the manager, but from the staff. What they ask, uh, what they perceive about interventions is about the nepotism and favoritism. They also use metaphors in this mm, and to, to describe the intervention as, like you can see, channel. We say it's saluran, or cantelan in Indonesia, or hook, and pohon asam, or tamarind tree because. The analogy of tamarind tree, you know, it's a big, and you can um, you can have or you can sit comfortably under the trees. So that's what they say about the nepotism or favoritism. Api also a fire because they said when you become uh, closer to fire, it is comfortable for you. So, okay, thank you. And one they said factor kedekatan or closeness. This is the metaphor that. I came from the respondents. So, uh, to wrap up, my research progress so far, just finishing the first stage of coding, and maybe it will have another coding, another stage, and my research purpose have theoretical and practical purpose, and other potential issues to be discussed later on is experiencing working in conflict areas, because I got also that comment from the respondents. And I will. Um, there are also psychological, contra psychological contract or other related policies that uh, needs to be discussed further in my research process. So I think that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Ibu Sediani. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we now have our last paper, Gusti Ayu in the Ghanasari, uh, talking on black ducks, backstabbing, and no stopping. Using visual methods in the study of corruption and organizational change in Indonesian public institutions. You know, change. I like it's um, any alteration from one state to another state over time, and it, when it happens in organization, it's called organizational change. So it, it can be in the form of a change in the structure, in the process, or um, cultural change or technological change. It, it, it can be incremental or radical. Okay, so for for a general term, I can give you that definition. And corruption, I think everybody is familiar. <laughs> All right. Um, this is the outline of my presentation. Although I will be focusing on the method 
um, on a few first slides, I will talk about the background uh, of my study. And after um, presenting my method, I will uh, present you some of the data and also the discussion, and then I will uh, close my presentation with a summary. Okay, we start with the gap in the literature. As a PhD student, we are expected to um, give contribution to knowledge. So, um, both phenomena, organizational change and corruption, have been studied extensively by different authors um, in different fields of studies. However, surprisingly, um, there is not much research on the interplay between both phenomena, how um, both of them affect each other. And one of the, I think, to my knowledge, uh, Martin and Johnson and Cullen's paper is the only one uh, which is discussed the interplay uh, between organizational change and corruption. If you know any other paper, just let me know. But that's uh, uh, the one that I know. Uh, the problem is that paper is con a conceptual paper, so it's lack of evidence. And also, um, they suggested that organizational change may induce corruption. And they assume that there is no corruption exists before the change. Mm -hmm. So they only look at one side of the interplay, how change can affect corruption, but the other side of the interplay, interplay how corruption may may uh, affect change is still overlooked. Okay, so there is the gap in the literature which I identified. So my study uh, will try to provide empirical evidence uh, about the interplay between both phenomena and I will um, ex uh, extend the framework by exploring not only how change affects corruption but also the other way around, how corruption affects change, all right? Uh, so um, we address both, in, uh, both sides of the interplay. And also, um, my study complement the previous literature by taking into consideration the condition of corruption, uh, the condition of corruption which exists both before and after the change. And to fulfill this, Studies objective. I will use uh, the case study of the the reformation of the Indonesian Tax Authority. Okay, I I put this to um, describe the case study. I made this poster when I was uh, in my first year of my PhD. Can everybody see? No, mm -hmm. that's alright. I will take you through. So, mm -hmm. um, the reform start in two thousand and two. So there were lots of problems before um, they started the reform, uh, which include low registered, low number of registered taxpayer, low tax compliance, poor service quality, and also of course corruption. And then they started the reform in 2002. Um, they did it gradually, um, gradually until 2008. So uh, in 2002, they they established a pilot project. Uh, two tax offices, which they call large tax offices, as a pilot project, and it was a success. And the change include um, change in the structure, the organizational tra structure, human resource management, which include increase in salary and also the, the um, application of code of ethic for the employee, and also change in the business process and also technological change, and also the application of good government good governance. And in 2008, um, they, all of the tax offices in Indonesia were, they call it modern, modernization, so all of them were modernized. Uh, and there were some success stories from the reform. Uh, I read in Jakarta Post uh, that the reform of the tax office is, is considered as one of um, the most successful reform at that time in 2010. But then, in 2010, have any of you heard about Gaius? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it happened, and it's, it's like boom. <laughs> like, um, it, it really affected uh, the reform, which was 
um, thought by lots of people who are successful. So, right, so that's about uh, the picture of the case. Um, so, in relation to the previous slide about the gap in the, the, in the literature, so there is a organizational change, yeah, there is a change, and also there, there are corruption existed before and after the change. So I think uh, by doing research uh, in this case, I think we will we'll enable me to answer um, and to fill the gap in the, in the literature. Okay, the next question is how um, I did the research. Um, I use qualitative research method in collecting the data. Um, I did semi-structured interview and also visual method which include drawings and photographs. Um, but today I will just focus on the visual method, especially the drawing, because it is a less common method used in both uh, organizational change and also corruption. I, think. I understand that there are few studies in organizational change which use visual method, but I haven't found any studies in corruption which use visual method. Okay, these are um, the reason why uh, I use visual methods, but um, I will po point out the, the this one. Okay, that visual method can be used as a catalyst to see the unsaid. Mm. Yeah, when I, uh, they, uh, Fins and Brosin uh, did a research about organizational change and they um, explored about how employee feel about the change. So it's about emotion. But when I when I read uh, the paper, I um, I thought I might use this in my study because um, I was worried uh, initially that because the uh, because the, the topic is quite sensitive, mm -hmm. it's about corruption. I was I was worried that uh, people might not want to talk about. Uh, corruption. Yeah, I was wrong, I know. <laughs> in the interview. <laughs> that was my worry. But theoretically, um, combining a different method uh, will be useful for uh, the reason of triangulation. So, you, uh, so the, the result from different method can confirm um, each other. So how is it done? Um, this is for the drawing. Okay. I did the drawing um, in two focus groups. One of them was with uh, middle managers and the other one was with staff. All right, so this is how I do it. I follow um, the procedure which was taken by Bros in 2008. Um, I, I, in the group, uh, first of all, I ask them individually to draw. So I, I give them instruction, uh, please, produce a drawing which describe how you feel or think about the change and corruption. Mm. And they, they did it individually in 10 minutes. And then the next stage, I asked them to um, reflect on the drawing. Ask them, I asked them to write at the back of the drawing uh, about five or 10 words about the image. And then the next stage is show and tell. I asked them to show the drawing each of them in turn, and then tell their story about the drawing, and then it, fo it was followed by group discussion, and then they did the discussion. And at the end of the focus group, I asked them to reflect in a group about the process, how, how um, they, f they felt about the process of producing images. Okay. Are you still with me? <laughs> yes. Okay, that was the collection of the data. Now, how uh, I'm analyzing my data. Um, data <coughs> analysis using visual method is not uh, much yet, especially in middle management study. I don't know, maybe in, in another field like psychology or education, maybe these methods are more uh, common, commonly used. I use a thematic analysis, so I transcribed you know, when I did the focus group, I recorded them, and then I, I did the 
transcribing from uh, the, the recording, and then I look for theme or common issues. But well, while I'm uh, well, uh, while I was reading the transcript, I also look at the image uh, to understand how each individual put meaning on that image, because everybody can put different. Uh, interpretation on different uh, different image. I will show you later. When I show the, the images, I will ask you how you uh, interpret them. Okay. All right. Now get ready for the first picture. This is the first picture. <laughs> Before I show you the narrative of this picture, can anyone um, guess what is it about? Yeah, with them opium. Ah, <laughs> clever. <laughs> this one, the black, black dog. Yes. Black dog. Yeah. Well done. Thank you. Anyone mm -hmm. else wants to try? No. Okay. What about? Yeah. What about <laughs> yeah. The first one. Yeah. Okay. Got to deal. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You can guess who it is. Okay. This is what the participant said. Previously, we were like ducks in the muddy water. Mm. All employees looked the same, muddy. With the modernization or the clean water, the white ducks which used to look muddy have started to look clean. Mm. Well, the black ones look black, still look black. <laughs> there are naughty employees, those who I mean as the black ducks. Here is the leader. We need a leader. We depend on the leader. Okay, so you are right. <laughs> so the black one is um, the naughty employee or those who are involved in corruption. But what the pi what the picture is uh, showing is it's really powerful in, in showing the interplay between change and corruption. Because in the past, all were looked the same, muddy, even though there were some, actually there were some white ducks there. But because of the environment um, in the past, it was very, very corrupt. Mm -hmm. So everybody looked the same, muddy. But then after the change, um, the participant viewed the change as a, a cleansing, mm -hmm. as the water which can clean the black, not the black one, the muddy duck mm -hmm. into the, the, the white one. So they, they look white now, but the mm -hmm. black one still persists. That was their use. <laughs> <laughs> And also, uh, uh, she pointed out that it will depend on the leader. Yeah, it will depend on the leader. And the leader is not on this blue. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Pardon? <laughs> okay. I think the, the, image is, uh, the image is so powerful. I, I really like that image. Um, okay. I will compare the image with the interview data. Um, this uh, transcript, yeah, it, it comes, yeah, this transcript. So this is from the interview. So it's it's almost the same, although the way they, they, they say it is different. Uh, like this participant said that, so they also said about white and black. Mm -hmm. In the past, the white one is, Small. This is a different participant, not yes. the dark one. Yeah, this is different participant. So in the past, the white one, so uh, he made like a, a, a proportion. Mm -hmm. uh, in the past, 20% was white, 20% uh, was black, and mm -hmm. the middle, most of them were gray. Mm -hmm. The muddy, the muddy that were gray. Mm -hmm. Like they, they did that not because they wanted to do it, because of the environment. Maybe because the leader asked them, or maybe because of the position. Mm -hmm. But after the change, the grey one turned into white. So now after the change, the white one is become 80%. But 20% of the black one is still there. So despite, despite the change, it's not easy to be just mm -hmm. corruption, isn't mm -hmm. it? <laughs> but this, this, is, this, this mm -hmm. is the improvement. Okay, these uh, are another interview data which showed uh, about very significant change. Uh, they, they also talk about naughty, the same as the uh, black one. Okay, so what I, I'm trying to say that 
uh, between image and interview. Uh, they confirm each other. So uh, it confirmed other studies finding that there is a confirmatory role of visual data to interview. Mm -hmm. And also, um, image uh, is able to stimulate a uh, response because the participant who drew um, the duck was a shy participant, like when, but but her images was was so powerful. Like when after he, uh, she showed the image, I asked uh, her, "What do you mean by naughty employee?" Because because she said about naughty employee, she didn't want to talk. Mm -hmm. So I I I assume that if I did interview with her, she might not she might not talk, but with the drawing, um, it came out. It came out. Right. So also, uh, they use a feminism and metaphor mm -hmm. to describe corruption. But um, there is a potential of using the details. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Like, not all of the data uh, can emerge from the image. Some mm -hmm. of the, the information which uh, was told by the uh, was told by a participant in the, in the interview did not come from the image. This is the second one. Um, I will do it quickly because I have five minutes left. Okay, this is how uh, the participant felt after Gaius' case. Mm. Mm. Any striking mm. thing that you notice? Mm. 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 The knife. Mm. Okay. Mm. okay. Mm. It, he thought that it's like backstabbing mm. because they thought that they, they've been clean, but still there are few employees who do that and it was like backstabbing, it's painful for them. Do you notice the face? Mm -hmm. But he's smiling. Mm -hmm. Even though it's painful, he's smiling because and also the this. Yeah? Mm -hmm. He said we on. have to we have to move forward. Mm -hmm. We have to mm -hmm. keep this we want to keep moving even even despite of all of the obstacles. Okay, uh, I wish I could uh, explain this, but uh, okay, just uh, it's the same like um, the previous image. There is a confirmatory role between visual and image, but also in the in the second image, uh, it also uh, proves that image can convey complex idea because. What have been told? What has been told by the, the participant in in the backstabbing uh, image was uh, also told by the interview participant. But uh, in the interview, it's not just come from one person, but uh, many different person told that. So uh, uh, the accounts from some of the interview participant can be um, conveyed in just one still image, in the backstabbing image. And also it shows the paradoxical emotion, mm -hmm. like uh, he felt painful, but he, he, he also felt optimist, mm -hmm. like smiling, uh, because he wants the, the reform to keep moving. This is another uh, positive uh, image about the uh, organizational change, like he said, uh, almost the same as, as the previous one, not not to stop. Okay. And uh, these are other um, images from other participants. Uh, most of them um, describe the change as a long and winding road, as a journey, as a long and winding road, uh, which I found interesting because um, in the interview, even though the interview participants also talk about problems, but they also talk uh, much about the changes, the good improvement from the change. But the drawing participant, they talk more about the problems. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I, I think that's another power of image in reveal, uh, to, to reveal uh, the dark side of the change or the organization. Okay, uh, this come up from the uh, the group reflection. So um, the participant uh, thought that the image make, make them more focused on their discussion and also to retain their original thought. Because when, when you, you do group discussion, when other people talk about other things, then you might 
mm. you might change your thought, but because mm. you are asked to draw um, initially, so your thought are there to be shared to other. Okay, but they also I recognize that it, it doesn't suit anyone. Um, I found it is uh, I found resistant to draw from some participants, but um, at the end all of them produced image, and also image cannot represent all of the views of. Um, someone and it need to be explained verbally because different um, person might have different opinion all right so as the saying say um, a picture is worth a thousand words but in this study my study has suggested uh, um, that if you use images as your method it might be beneficial if you also use another method to, because as, as it showed that there is a possibility of losing some of the details, so if you, you use other methods, uh, then the, the, the result might be complemented each other. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So if you stay up here, and, and we'll bring chairs. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. three were very exact, yeah. so you kept your time, which is great, you give us a lot of space, and all three of you have very different approaches when looking at Prema, which is obviously something that came out very strongly in Joshua Oppenheimer's films, and second, looking at the Audit office, which is obviously something that the British had in terms of the customs and excise service, which was paid four times the mm -hmm. uh, salaries of uh, ordinary civil servants, but you could be fired for making a copy um, edit mistake, yeah? and you were never sent to your home area because you, you couldn't have Jaringan or Tao um, mm -hmm. yeah. okay. yeah. okay. mm -hmm. And the third, very interestingly, about the issue of how you can have a foil to your quantitative data in terms of your interview techniques by asking people subliminally to express this through art. So without further ado, um, I'll open it up to all of you and, um, at the back. Yeah. Us. Yes, <laughs> thank you for said, yeah, this interesting uh, presentation on Preman on the Port. I uh, would like to ask uh, to your estimation, uh, the the money involved in this regulatory no, informal security uh, business in the port uh, how much is to your estimation and uh, how about the prospect in the in the near future thank you yeah. we'll take three questions so elizabeth I, I want to just add to that question and can you tell us a bit about the business model actually of these organizations so not just how much money overall is involved but how you know by going out and blowing up boats how does that how do they get paid by whom through what mechanisms what's the sort of business model of that protection or racket besides just getting salaries for, for being guards so this is the Susi Puchiestuti era yeah mm -hmm. destroying uh, foreign Legal or, or for any of the other, yeah. for cooperating on trafficking or any of the other things that you, you described. And may I, since, may I ask another question to another participant, <laughs> sorry. Just on, on the issue of, um, of uh, human resource distribution, you didn't at any point mention anyone saying how much they had to pay to get a job in different places. I, I'm surprised that didn't come up. I just wonder why you think it didn't. And we have time for the third. I just wanted to 
to all the participants, really. In your research, did you come across any other interesting links between corruption and other forms of transnational crime? Other forms of? Transnational, or, or crime. So maybe we start with, with you about the issue of, of the internal security and Elizabeth's question about the business methods mm -hmm. and the issue of actually paying for jobs because obviously mm -hmm. that's a big issue in the police. The first question, I'll be very honest, I don't know how much money involved. Uh, it's very hard to trace and um, the prospects seemingly this group will continue to be active in the future. Um, and in terms of the first question, the business model, seemingly um, from talking to people, the business model is uh, sometimes in these organizations, the people who are quite high up, they are, or they are lawyers, so the way they get paid is part of the legal fee. So the legal fee is include the security fee as well. So people, um, one of the person that I talked to say that, um, yeah, if you can see that uh, how can a lawyer like that get paid so much? Because um, that's not only covering his legal fee; it also covers the the group that he that he, that behind him uh, that secure the part or other parts of um, the vital object. And I do so, not so that's part of a package. Yeah, so like a package deal. Yeah, so it's, it's ten percent of the yeah. of the total um, uh, budget or, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So sometimes uh, the business model also, for example, they uh, the leader they sign a cooperation deal. Uh, the, the deal is more on distribution of rights, for example, uh, for uh, cooperative shops across the Indonesia, but also. Um, as part of the deal, because they are the one who in charge in distributing rice. I found this in the, the, the area in the Tanjung Pinang and also Batam, other parts that in the border area. Um, as part of the deal uh, that they got from the Indonesian Chamber of Commerce or other related institutes, they be the one who also deal with the illegal smuggling of uh, rice, for example, from Thailand, from the, maybe Singapore or other parts. So it's really related. So the boss will say, so the leader will sign the deal with the government authority and then he will tell uh, his other um, men in the field, for example, those that uh, work in Anjung Pinang to, you know, if there is a illegal rice coming from uh, other part of Southeast Asia, you be the one to deal with that. Um, so, that, but unfortunately, I don't have the data of how much money involved in in this uh, in this um, business, quite of the leaders they are they shy away. They don't want to mention about how much they get out of that. Um, but also in North Sulawesi, uh, the interesting part is quite a lot of those leaders in North Sulawesi of the militias. They are actually very wealthy businessmen. So uh, they support the group. They support the group out of their own pocket. But then in return, for example, if he is a very successful contractor, say he win on the one in North Sulawesi, for example, the Brigade Mami, the leader is a very wealthy businessman, he win all the contract to build roads uh, in the area. So those people that that uh, depend on him, they will guard his projects, uh, for example. And, uh, uh, and in terms of corruption and transnational crimes, I found it more on during my field work for my third case study, which is in the Riau Island and Tanjung Pinang, uh, especially. Uh, so in there, uh, it's where the type of groups are different. In uh, Batam, it's more a very proper organized uh, group. But in Tanjung Pinang, it's very loosely organized. Uh, this local youth, for example, but uh, they involve in the smuggling, for example, smuggling of rice, smuggling of other types of goods uh, for illicit activities. So in the port, there are two types of port. One is the legal one, and then the other one is the one that being held by this 
civilian paramilitary groups. And finally, the corruption also play an important role in there because uh, the businessmen who involve in the illicit activities, they pay the maybe the Navy officer, officer, the customs, the port authority, so they will turn blind eye on the activity that happened on the other port. Or sometimes in, in other, um, because in that area, there are lots of ports, lots of small ports. Um, so they just leave those people alone. Uh, quite a lot of activities also happen like in the evening. So at daylight, uh, it's a normal legal activity. In the evening, then there'll be like vessels coming over and carrying up um, the illicit activities. And there will be a, a set of system already being set by the these uh, groups. Uh, for example, they have the the labor associations. They have, not the labor officer, but the laborers who dealing with the cargoes, they have the security guards, but they are all part of the illicit ne network. Um, yeah. That's the case with Marunda and with Tanjung Priok, uh, or it's too close to the capital? I don't really find that in Marunda and Tanjung Priok, it's mm -hmm. more in the in the Riau right. and also Tanjung Pinang. In Marunda there is, but it's not that obvious. In Tanjung Pinang, yeah, it's, it's very common. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. thank, thank you for that question. It's a very interesting question. Um, frankly speaking, I didn't ask them about the respondents about how much they pay because it used to happen yeah, in Indonesia when you want to uh, work for the government, you have to put a lot of money to bribe them. But um, it comes up in the interview process when I ask them about the recruitment process. Um, and um, respondents confessed that they said, well, uh, since um, reform era, since era reform, the recruitment process is more, is more transparent and cleaner, they said. Because um, the selection process is held by the Ministry of um, State of Empowerment, and the, um, the, minimum, the minimum passing grade is um, determined by the Minister of State of, um, what's that? State of Empowerment. Um, yeah, the state of um, empowerment of civil apparatus. So it's done by the other ministry. It's done lo uh, lo centrally and nationally. So it's um, transparent now. It's more transparent now. And they, they said uh, some of the respondents said that they don't have to pay any single amount for being recruited into um, this audit organization. But there's another um, response that um, for me it's quite interesting. It is, inter it is interesting to dig more and to analyze <coughs> more when the, some of the respondents that have been um, relocated to the most eastern part, the Papua, confess about why uh, they, they thought that they are being removed. They, they said that uh, one of the respondents said, I think I have been punished.